Welcome back. I'm Gary Parr, and you are listening to Fiber Talk, that twice weekly podcast for people who make fine art with the needle and the thread. And as we promised three or four weeks ago, we have back with us Linda Eaton. Hi, Linda. Hi, Gary. Thanks for joining us once again. Now, for those who uh, didn't hear, and you missed out if you didn't, so go back and listen to the first one. Linda is the John L. and Marjorie P. McGraw Ooh. Director of Collections and Senior Curator of Textiles at Winterthur Museum in Winterthur, Delaware. That's right. Not that there's any junior curator of textiles. I'm the textile department. Oh. <laughs> That's how that works. <laughs> 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 if, Which means you know, I'm old. Is that what that means? Yeah. Yeah. Hey, if you're the only one, you can be. It's easy to be senior, right? Right. Exactly. Yeah. yeah you go for it. So um, uh, we promised Linda would come back, and we were going to talk about Linda's uh, whatever career, her needlework and textile career. But we changed our minds, and we're going to talk about some of Linda's favorite hot topics, like embroidery as art. So um, that'll be fun. Uh, but before we do that, my friend Arlene Cohen visited the current Embroidery, the Thread of History uh, ex exhibition just oh, uh, just here a week ago, a week or two ago, and bought me a book. Ha <laughs> ha! Oh, fabulous! Ha <laughs> ha! So I win there. Yes. So I have been enjoying that. What fun to put something like that together! Yeah, um, I'm so lucky. Yes, you are. <laughs> you really are. To be able to, you know, quality, you know, heavy, heavy uh, stock, good photography, the whole bit. Yeah, that's, um, those things don't get done for 10 cents on the dollar here. Well, and I'm very fortunate that Leslie Fleischner, who's a museum supporter in Pittsburgh, um, has funded these publications. Otherwise, um, uh, they would just disappear into the ether. Yes, and that'd be a shame. Yeah. So, yeah, so Leslie and Hans Fleischner. Yeah. They're Are great, they? great supporters. Well, that's fantastic, yeah. So, and, and then uh, another thing that Arlene threw into the uh, package that she sent me was the um, the little uh, promotional card for your upcoming Costuming the Crown exhibition that oh, starts in March. Yeah. March 30th it opens. Oh, boy. And I have to say, you know, those kinds of shows are not my usual deal. Uh -huh. because people don't blow things up. Um, mm -hmm. But my wife sucked me into that one, and that's a fantastic show. And oh, to see all the costumes, that's going to be terrific. So, Well, you know, from the embroidery point of view, it's absolutely fascinating. We've had one shipment um, arrive already, and uh, one of the things that's in it is the imitation, you know, the replica of the coronation garments. And so the outer mantle that the queen wore, the real one is, you know, heavily embroidered with gold and silver and silk and stuff. Well, the the one that they use to film um, is, you know, made with polyester and, um, and the, uh, instead of embroidery, it's painted on. It's amazing. It's oh, beautiful. Oh, really? It's beautifully done, and you know one of the things that we're going to have is is um, uh, the ability to compare what you see in the flesh with how it appears on the screen, and it's extremely convincing on the screen. Whoa! Would never have thought that. I was I was going to ask you how uh, well done the embroidery is. You know, just going on this picture on the uh, promotional card. Right. Figuring that was all embroidered quickly by someone for the for the uh, TV show. Holy no, smokes. That's not, that's not embroidered. But there are things that are embroidered, like the um, uh, 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 train for um, uh, Queen Elizabeth's uh, wedding. Um, and that took, um, you know, a bunch of people, a whole bunch of of, of days and nights to uh, do very quickly. And so one of the really interesting things is, com is, is you know, to, to see how things that have been done quickly, but very beautifully done, you know, appear on the screen and how convincing they are. The magic of Hollywood. <laughs> yeah. yeah, one of the things one of the designers, uh, Jane Petrie, told us was that um, uh, real diamonds don't show well on screen because they glitter too much. <laughs> oh, no. 
we're really looking forward to this. It's going to be a lot of fun. And so the the second shipment of the costumes, it's on its way now, and we're going to start um, getting ready to start mounting them. And and uh, we've written all of the labels, and we're we're really working on it. So. Uh, that's going to be fantastic. Well, well yeah, we, we talked about uh, you and Laura Mina joining us um, when that e- exhibition opens to do a show and talk about uh, getting all that prep work done. So, um, Yeah, and Laura Laura is doing such a fabulous job. She uh, is uh, relatively new at Winterthur, and she came to us from the Costume Institute, so she's very experienced um, with costumes. So it's great. She's been She's been wonderful. Yeah, and anyone who missed the show with her, I think two weeks ago now, with Laura talking about uh, the work that she does, go back and listen to that because, wow, what a lady. That's fantastic work. <laughs> <laughs> and you're a curator, too. She said that she said in the thing that um, uh, it's two cur- when you guys are working on an exhibition, it's two curators <laughs> collaborating. That sounds like fun. Well, so I, I was a conservator. A conser- a conservator. Not, not a cur- cur- conservator, yeah. yes. Yeah, and so so I was a conservator, and I came initially to Winterthur as the head of the textile conservation lab, but then I moved over to the dark side, as my conservation colleague said, <laughs> um, and and now I'm a, a curator. <laughs> the dark side, no. Yeah, yeah. Well, but when the cur- the curatorial staff were offended by that, and they said that I was coming to the light. And I told that to one of our public safety staff, and he looked at me and he said, but isn't that what they call a near-death experience? (laughs) Mm, mm. There's a perspective, yes. (laughs) Yep. Well, so looking forward to that, uh, my my wife and I suggested we may have to put together a road trip to come and see that one. Oh, great. Well, let me know when you're coming. We'll roll out the red carpet. Okay. All right. We'll do that. So the, the, the first topic for us today is whether embroidery is art and looking through this book embroidery the thread of history from the current exhibition and and you 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 know i look at these things uh, old things old uh pieces of embroidery and textile work and then i look at the uh the new casket uh, piece that uh, uh janet brant did yeah, it's beautiful, isn't it? Oh, and then the the video when she the video she did that I put a link to and I'll put it in this podcast that shows all the things that are inside it is absolutely mind blowing, which you suggested it would be. Um, so so that brings up the question then: Why is is needlework not generally viewed as art? And uh, you know, I mentioned um, the person that we had had as a guest who lives in Bavaria who was struggling with the German government to get classified as an artist, and Jessica Grimm is her name. And uh, she she's a needlework designer and teacher and stitcher, and, and uh, she creates art. But you look through this embroidery, the thread of history book and, and from the exhibition, and it raises the question, and I, I know you raise the question all the time, why is this not art? Is this, is this, like, is this a men thing? You know, it, it can't be art because it's women with needle and thread? Uh, it just, the more I thought about it and read through this book, it's like, why, yeah, why isn't what we do art? Well, I'll have to send you my, the booklet from my previous exhibition, because that's what the topic was about, um, embroidery, the language of art. And, uh, the thing is, is that the word art with a capital A has the meaning of that word has changed over time. And so what we think of as art today is not necessarily how people thought about that in the 19th, 18th, 17th centuries. Um, And the early definitions of the word, and if you look it up in the Oxford English Dictionary, just means a skill that you have learned. And you cannot tell me that embroidery is not a skill (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> a highly skillful practice that you have to learn. Um, uh, and so um, it was really before the the 18th century that there wasn't the same distinction between art and craft. And in the 19th, in the middle of the 19th century and later, that's the kind of thing that people like William Morris were advocating, was bringing them back together so that um, you know, all of these things would be, uh, you know, considered as art. Uh, 
because there's a certain craft to, you know, being a painter or a sculptor, you know, you have to understand those craft techniques. Um, but it really was the 18th century where, where the people that consider themselves fine artists start broke, <laughs> broke away from the crowd. <laughs> yeah. Cause it, it really is when, when it comes to painting, I mean, you, you, you have to learn how to mix paints. You learn, learn have to learn brush strokes, uh, which brush to use whether the brush is too stiff, too soft, uh, how to create texture and dimension. Uh, right, and how to no... layer it, how colors mix, and you have to learn a lot. Yeah, how is that different from what we do with thread? Not at all. E exactly, exactly. Yeah. Well, the other, the flip side of it, too, is that most young women learned basic embroidery techniques at school, but they were also learning how to draw and paint. Uh, very few schools taught oil painting, and, and the reason for that was because oil takes a long time to dry, um, and uh, and there are you know and there are technical issues about working uh, with oils, but these schools did teach drawing and they taught watercolor painting, and one of the teachers of um, Clementina Beach, who was a teacher at the Saunders and Beach School in Boston. She commissioned her own portrait to be painted by Gilbert Stewart, who was in Boston, when he, living in Boston when, when he was uh, fairly old. And so she commissioned her portrait, and then she went back and she paint, painted, she copied her own portrait to teach herself how to do it, because women could not apprentice in you know, men's studios at the time. And so she was, she was not the only one. There are other examples of subjects um, who were, uh, whose portraits were painted by Gilbert Stewart, women who went off, went back home and copied the portrait that they, he painted of them to teach themselves how to, how to paint. Is it, is it, is it because women use needle and thread is, is part of it because women use needle and thread to sew clothes and men clothes? Is it, is it because the origin of the tool that creates this perception, is that part of it? No, I think that it was a divergence of um, attitude and approach to different elements of the creative crafts or creative arts or whatever you want to call them. Um, uh, there used to be something um, called the Society of Artists in London uh, in, and in the mid 18th century, what now is the Royal Academy of Art broke away and they were all of the painters like Benjamin West and, you know, all of these hoity toity painters who considered themselves different from printmakers, embroiderers, uh, um, sculptors. And uh, and so there really was this kind of uh, divergence. But earlier on, one of the lectures at our needlework conference uh, was Joan Dijon, and she told us, to the to the um, uh, amazement of the audience, she told us that at the court of the Sun King, so Louis the Fourteenth in France, the embroiderers were paid more than the painters. Oh. Yeah, exactly. Huh. <laughs> so there. Yeah. <laughs> and the other the other thing is is that we have. Um, in our collection, a very generous uh, gift from uh, Julie uh, Lindbergh, an embroidered version of Benjamin West's painting of um, uh, William Penn and uh, the treaty with the In Indians. And it turns out, and this research was done by Leah Lane, who is one of our, our great graduates, who's now um, working out in Cincinnati. Um, she discovered a matching um, painting that was um, depicting West's death, death of General Wolfe painting. And both of these embroideries were exhibited at the Society of Artists exhibition in central London alongside William Woollett's copies, I mean, in the next room from William Woollett's prints of those paintings um, in 1776. Hmm. So there you've got it. You've got a variety of different art made with different media being exhibited in galleries in London in the 1770s. So what changes the perception today? What is, is it education? Is it 
continuing to have exhibitions that equate painting and art and sculpture and needlework? Uh, or is it just a societal thing that we have to deal with? Well, I think that too has changed over time. I mean, initially as Benjamin West and the Royal Academy broke away from other types of artists, um, uh, they were um, uh, promoting their uh, art, their painting, right, as being superior to, to others. Um, and that kind of did settle into the, the psyche internationally. Um, people like William Morris tried to fight against that approach, um, and people did embrace that, but but the other flip side of what William Morris was doing was trying to get people to recognize the value of craft, right? So you think of the arts and crafts movement, right? Mm -hmm. um, and so they do, that, they do um, uh, make that distinction. What's really interesting to think about now is that we have things like postmodernist art and conceptual art where, um, you know, the, the, the art might be an experience, you know, that's right. not, a, not a lasting one. Right. And so, so it really, you know, you can really play with your mind. And so what, what people considered to be art with a capital A has, has shifted over time. And, and in my last exhibition, what I wanted to do was to, to show how, how certainly at one time, uh, embroidery was considered art with a capital A. And, uh, you know, I think a lot of the reason for that it, 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 it's not often considered that now um, widely, I think is, uh, you know, leftover baggage that we're take, carrying with, still carrying with us from the demeaning of things like Berlin wool work in the 19th century, um, uh, and and frankly, misogyny. I mean, you know, it's often women, right? Yeah. So it it there's I think there's a very long and complex mix. Nicole Bololin, who's a, another one of our graduates who did her thesis on Berlin wool work, found that the pejorative literature, so the the critical people writing critically about embroidery, um, she was particularly looking at Berlin wool work in the 19th century, right? But she found that people were using very, very similar words and phrases, and the attitudes were same. Uh, people complaining, men complaining about needlework in the 17th century and the 18th century, right? So it's not the needlework, because you know that types of needlework that people would do would change dramatically. Um, I think I think it's the role of women in society. Hmm. That's a tough nut to crack there, yeah. Yeah. It sure is. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, and it, it's it also uh, another aspect of it is we have several people who do thread art, do abstract things. Oh, uh, and just beautiful things. Yeah, beautiful. and and that's immediately classified as art, or at least that's my perception. Uh, it's it's not a, a reproduction sampler. It's not a piece of needlepoint. Uh, charted design or something, but it, w when they do that, then oh, look at that artist. What they and they did that with thread as opposed to paint, and so it's that's an interesting uh, uh, middle ground, I guess, for this. It, it is it is an interesting middle ground, but it it's been a long time coming. And so in the 1930s, Georgiana Harbison, who was um, a designer theater designer, painter, and embroiderer um, wrote a book about American embroidery, including many things contemporary to her time, and arguing that embroidery is art, right? So so that's the 1930s, right? So mm -hmm. we've been fighting this fight for a long time. <laughs> and, then, and then bring folk art into this. Oh, that drives me crazy. Okay. So... so <laughs> So there are various ways of defining folk art, art and people have um, made a distinguishing, uh, they distinguish between outsider art and so-called folk art. But one of the general accepted uh, attitudes towards folk art is people who are not academically trained. Well, you look at samplers and you look at silkwork pictures and you compare that to maybe a Philadelphia Rococo high chest that no one would ever consider to be folk art. Mm 
and the women who did that embroidery were more highly educated than the men who apprenticed to make that freaking furniture. <laughs> and so, so I, you know, it just drives me crazy. And so my take on it is. Oops. Okay, go ahead. So what drives me crazy about people associated associating needlework with folk art um, is that one of the definitions of folk art is that it is um, done by people who are not um, academically trained to do it. And so if you compare needlework samplers and needlework pictures that are done by highly educated young women at school and you compare them to say a Philadelphia Rococo high chest that is done by a bunch of men who have been apprenticed but not educated, um, you know, frankly, of those two, the high chest should be folk art and the samplers and needlework pictures um, should be academic classical art, in my opinion. And so, it, you know, it, it's such a, 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 a an odd thing. And so my take on, on folk art is that it's an aesthetic and that aesthetic is kind of slightly different for different people and, and at different times. But it, it, you know, because folk art is so difficult to define, um, that I think that really it is an aesthetic. And I feel very strongly that certainly samplers and needlework pictures done at school should not be considered folk art. Yeah, I, I, w I would agree. <laughs> I mean, if, but, but the, the word art is in folk art, for crying out loud. Uh, <laughs> Um, yeah, but the word folk demeans it, right? Yes. Yeah, because it, it like whatever you get. a female artist, that means you're not real, you know, are you not good enough to be just called an artist? Right. Or a fiber artist, aren't you good enough to be called just an artist? Yeah, why do we have to define? Yes. Or qualify. Exactly. Yes. Yeah. Because, yeah, if folk art, the minute you hear that, at least in my mind, it, the, it, it falls into a perception of a second tier uh, creativity thing uh, and, and falls in it to me next to that word craft, which also right. uh, has connotations that are not, I don't know, <laughs> not of a higher level, I guess. I don't know. Right. Right. And I think it's an interesting time because I think that with all of the um, uh, boom in conceptual art, um, and and art as experience rather than you know something that is a long lasting thing, um, I think that um, people might be rethinking all of these distinctions over time, and I can see it changing into the future. Well, yeah, and that's just it. it artists these days really don't care what medium they work in. I mean, there's there's any number of of artists who work in all manner of things from metal to paper to whatever it is all fall into the art category and right. uh, and and needle and thread and linen is just another material um right it's uh, right and so and so there you know there are people there are a number of people you know whose whose work with a needle and thread is uh considered art but it's not you know, we're still working on making that attitude widely acceptable. I think as there are is uh, more focus on uh, uh, women's art, art made by women, and there are people around the world who are trying to recover information about all of the female painters, for example, um, you know, that maybe over time that attitude will spread to include women working in other media than paint. And that you know, that's interesting. You talk, talked about the women who had portraits made and then went and taught themselves painting by create, copying those portraits. I mean, I, I have essentially zero painting history education. Did they go on to create other works? Well, so the woman that I can document that is a woman named Clementina Beach. And she and Judith Saunders had a school in Boston in the early um, 19th century. And um, uh, 
Judith Saunders um, was the kind of uh, academic, you know, teaching English and math and stuff. And Clementina Beach was te teaching the more artistic sides of things like silkwork pictures that have got both painting and, um, and silk embroidery in them. And there are a number of pieces that survive uh, from their school. But the thing that people forget is that girls in these schools were not just learning embroidery. They were learning drawing. They were learning painting, generally not in oils, but a few schools did advertise that they taught in oils. The thing about oil paint is it takes longer to dry and it's, you know, it's, it smells and, you know, there's all sorts of other um, issues with it. But, um, you know, I think it's, I think that we should look at embroidery as one of many types types of artistic creative endeavors that women would learn at school. We need to get more men involved in the needlework. Maybe that well, we, maybe I, that turns the corner. I don't know. <laughs> well, I do have examples. Um, I do have examples by uh, by men in the collection. Um, one of them is. Um, uh, a, a ship's boy uniform and a, a sea bag that was heavily embroidered by a young man named Warren Opie. And uh, there's all of those woolies, those pictures of uh, generally of some kind of ship that were done often by sailors, but not exclusively so. Um, and so there were men who would embroider. And um, Warren Opie's uniform uh, is one of the most highly decorated ship's boys uniform that's known. Um, and um, Harry Langley, who did the research on, on this for us, could track him to um, the ship that Commodore Barry, uh, Perry took to Japan to open uh, Japan uh, oh. to trade with the West. And, um, and so, uh, it, it, you know, it's a very skillful piece of em embroidery, maybe not as highly skillful as some of these very elaborate silkwork pictures. Um, but there was a, a young man doing embroidery on a ship. Mm -hmm. And you talk about clothing and, and that's the, uh, the other thing in, from your perspective in your world, when we look at uh, say Norwegian uh, hard anger and, and the, the variations off of that, that were all created to uh, basically have a, an, a form of lace without having to buy ex extremely expensive lace and to decorate clothing, how, where does that fall in this art world? So, um, I, it's well, it's a, it, it's an interesting question. When when women were taught at school how to do um, needlework, they did both plain and fancy work, um, and that's the title of. Uh, Sue Swan's uh, book, which was the first book about social history and, and women's embroidery, plain and fancy. Some uh, prissy Quaker schools wouldn't teach fancy needlework. They only taught plain needlework, but plain needlework included cross stitch. So you could mark your linens for right. Uh, laundry, right? Um, but the fancy needlework, which was part of uh, the curriculum um, at school through to the middle of the um, 18th century or the 19th century um, was very was really very important. I've forgotten where I was going with that. <laughs> Remind me what your question was, it, Gary. It had to do with hard anger and the Nord and direct decorating. Oh, yes. Yeah, and so so women do different types of needlework at different times of their lives, right? And so once you've le learned how to do embroidery and elaborate kind of decoration. Then after school, after your school years, you can go on. And in the 19th century, women were doing beautiful embroideries on collars and cuffs for dresses and kerchiefs and um, bags. They were making beautiful reticules and embroidered bags to carry. Um, and so there was certainly, uh, we can document that the DuPont girls would be sitting there sewing, you know, mending their underwear or um, uh, uh, stitching uh, black powder bags and they would see people coming up to the, the walkway to visit them and they would stash all of that stuff and they would get out their um, embroidery for collars and cuffs <laughs> and fa more fancy embroidery that you would do socially. Mm -hmm. um, 
people. So at different times of the day and in different um, periods of people's lives, they would do different kinds of needlework. <laughs> Quick, put it away. Get the stuff, get the fancy stuff out. I, I love that. Yeah, yeah but, but I mean, that's one of the things that women did would, would have a needle and thread and be, uh, and be stitching as well as um, socializing. Yeah. And, and that, you know, the, the art, the clothing art, I mean, there's been much made Game of Thrones and the embroidery work that's been done in those costumes. And, right. uh, and, and there, there have been several, uh, several uh, shows, movies, shows that, that have elaborate, you know, the, the, the crown being one of them, where you have uh, costumes and, and clothing with, with the original stuff is elaborate embroidery. And uh, I mean, I, the perception I get when I read people's reactions to that is that is, is art. Yes. And, and um, you know, again, the, the value that we put on clothing has changed over time. And so um, the value of uh, elaborately embroidered court dress in London in the mid 18th century would be the equivalent of buying a really expensive sports car today, mm. right? And so nobody spends that kind of money on their clothes, or very few people do, right? Right. Um, uh, and so, you know, the the value, uh, the cultural value and the monetary value and the percentage of people's incomes that they spend on things like clothing and the decoration of clothing, which of course adds to the cost, um, has changed significantly over time. Yeah, Laura Miner was, was taking us through a little bit of that and how all of the layers of undergarments uh, really serve to protect the expensive exterior piece from the, the body oils and sweat and because the expectation was that that was going to last maybe through generations? Well, certainly a long time, and you would wear them long, maybe longer than a lot of people wear a lot of their throwaway clothes today. Um, uh, but one of the interesting things is that those underlying um, uh, layers are uh, the kind of thing that women might make for themselves, but they would also be a way that women could earn a living. Um, and so one of the things I'm interested in is uh, women using a needle and thread uh, professionally. And so even uh, before the advent of uh, sewing machines, wealthy women would employ uh, less well-off women to do their plain sewing for them, to make the shirts, to make the shifts, to make the undergarments that both men and women uh, would wear. And that was one of the reasons why you uh, poorer girls would do um, samplers was to show that they'd been educated and show that they were skilled with a needle and that, that, that would help with their employment opportunities. Okay, see this, every time I talk to somebody about samplers, I learn something more about the importance of that, that particular piece of, of needlework. Because the first time I encountered reproduction samplers, I, I just didn't get it. And then, <laughs> uh, it, because, it, it, okay, those are nice. But, but why would girls spend extensive amounts of time in school learning how to cross-stitch samplers? And now here's another aspect that had not come to me was to demonstrate so they could be employed to uh, do plain sewing. And, and that's, so there's, there's another aspect of it. So those samplers, those samplers just carry so much with them beyond just being old works from 10-year-old uh, girls. Right. And, and, you know, if you could get away with being a teacher rather than doing plain sewing for somebody else, you'd get paid more. So the other thing is, is that if you can show your skill and uh, you can teach other people how to do that needlework, you can be a teacher and that that would give you better pay than if you were um, plain sewing, you know, someone's underwear or hemming their sheets or something. All right. So take that that word professional into today's world. Where does, when it comes to needlework, textiles, needlework, uh, and not, not, not clothing, but where does the professional part come in? Because the, the raw definition of a professional is someone who makes, who actually makes money off of whatever it is that they do. I mean, that's your, your crude basic definition. So where does that come in? Well, that's really interesting. So 
Historically, there were professional embroiderers who were embroidering things like uh, flags, um, uh, military flags. Um, uh, there were embroiderers who were commissioned to work for aristocratic and royal households. What's really interesting is there are a small number, but there are there, of people uh, in America in the 18th century ad advertising that they will do embroidery for you. Um, sometimes they're men's names, and whether it's the men who could be doing the embroidery, because men did do professional embroidery, or um, women, or both, because the advertisements for a business was often in a man's name, but sometimes the business was run by a woman. Um, so it's really difficult to know. But they're off the men who advertise embroidery are often doing um, the kind of military embroidery for um, British uniforms, for example. Um, but women would learn those kind of skills too. And I do have examples on 18th century Philadelphia um, silkwork pictures of the kind of raised gold work embroidery that the skill that that technical skill is what you would need to embroider in military flags and military uniforms and things like that, right? So you could earn um, uh, money from that. But I think that the whole uh, professional and then the flip side of that is that dreaded word amateur um, <laughs> is very, very interesting because I'm currently researching uh, embroidery in the early 20th century. Um, and I brought up Georgiana Harbison before. Um, there were women artists like Marguerite Zorak who were producing embroidery and hooked rugs and things that were, uh, and they were considered artists, right? Mm -hmm. um, uh, but there were a lot of women who were um, wealthy women who could afford to pay others to do all of the housekeeping and all of that other kind of stuff that keeps women busy, um, uh, and who were incredibly skillful uh, with a needle and thread and, and would have um, exhibitions in New York City uh, to benefit charities, but the exhibitions were their own work. Sometimes they would ask someone else to do the designs for them, but sometimes they would design them themselves um, and, uh, and, and would exhibit that work um, at various um, uh, galleries around New York City. So it's, it's really kind of interesting because the whole idea of embroidery and the whole world of embroidery crosses so many different bridges. Yeah, that uh, that is true because we, we're seeing that uh, an emergence in the fashion world, the clothing and, and accessories world. There's been, at least in my perception, like I follow fashion carefully. I mean, but <laughs> but uh, but there, I've seen little tidbits just that I've tripped over of uh, embroidery and and needlework, needlepoint, and other things being used and commissioned to decorate purses or skirts or any number of things in the fashion world. And that's that's kind of a more recent thing. Well, and there are places, uh, there and there are many people who um, are professionally trained, for example, at the Royal School of Needlework in London, or at um, uh, uh, Lesage, the um, embroidery company that works for a lot of the couture houses in Paris, but of course, it's a, a, a difficult kind of um, uh, profession. Um, embroidery, uh, professionally, in terms of being the one that actually did the stitching, was not always the best paid job, especially um, as the fashions changed and the you know, elaborate gold and silver embroidery of the 17th and early 18th centuries um, changed. But there are still people who do professional embroidery, and those are the people who do the embroidery on... The costumes for Game of Thrones, they're often um, employed by uh, movies and television companies and things. So there were people professionally embroidering the veil for um, Queen, uh, then Princess Elizabeth's wedding dress um, for the crown, for example. Um, so there are people who are being uh, trained to do that. But alongside them, at the same time, there are many people who are equally skilled who are doing it um, for their own personal pleasure, right? Mm -hmm. and, uh, and then you start thinking about that dreaded word, hobby. I mean, I just am very conscious that I am so lucky to have a job that pays me 
to do the kind of research that other people do as an avocation. You know, yes. they do it for the <laughs> love of it, right? Right. And that's the same distinction between professional and amateur em embroidery. You know, you still need the same skills. Um, uh, and a professional might not be um, producing things that um, uh, are coming out of their own head. Um, uh, but they have an end purpose and are being paid for that skill of embroidery. And there are people who, who, who do that for a living. Yeah, of course, in, in from your perspective and from anyone who's, say, embroidering for Game of Thrones gowns and capes and so on, uh, there is that that pressure that a hobbyist doesn't have to deliver and deliver by a deadline and deliver a very specific and, and high quality product. So that there's right. that, that little extra pressure that a hobbyist does not have. Right. And one of the interesting things about the, the professional training, so these are not just the day classes, but the professional training courses that are run by organizations like the Royal School of Needlework, is that you are trained to uh, do work in a certain way so that if they're working on a large commission, like a wedding dress for royalty, you can have multiple people working on it and you will not see where one embroiderer starts and another, you know, stops right, and another right. one begins, right? And so there are certain techniques and things that you're trained to do so that your your skill and technique is interchangeable um, uh, with others. And so that um, also, you know, begs that whole question when you think, consider the word art is that, you know, what is it personal creative expression and what is it that that is that skill, right? Um, uh, and uh, not all art in the past was personal creative expression. You know, that's another attitude and approach to art mm -hmm. that has changed over time. And, and for the record, if my wife were sitting in this room right now, my standard T-shirt, jeans, and flannel shirt attire Talking about <laughs> talking about fashion and embroidery, my wife would be <laughs> laughing <laughs> uncontrollably. <laughs> but it is it is interesting, you know. Um, embroidery on clothing became very fashionable in this so-called arts and crafts movement, mm -hmm. you know, in the nineteenth and early twentieth century. And so there were more and more people who were employed to do that kind of embroidery um, then, and it cycles in and out of fashion. You know, like everything, but there are still uh, people. I think it was um, the House of Dior that has rescued Lesage, who's the main uh, professional embroidery workshop for the couture industry in Paris, uh, because they were really struggling to find uh, people and to um, uh, to have a sustainable, financially sustainable business. Um, uh, but those skills are so important to the couture industry still. Um, that um, you know, people have have stepped up to the plate and and uh, made in, enabled that continuity, enabled people to be continuing to be professional embroiderers. Yeah, and, well, and, and we have that's we have that you experience it, but to keep yeah to keep these skills, professional, amateur, whatever they are, hobbyist, to keep them going often does. There's many examples take benefactors take people who are willing to put forth chunks of money to to keep it alive or further the cause and uh um you know that takes a real appreciation i think an appreciation for the art of whatever it might be to to say hey i've you know i've got uh, 500 grand that i would like to make sure that this stays alive and and that's true but i i also think that you shouldn't underestimate the people who um, have a personal passion and inter interest. And so there's an awful lot of people who are uh, recovering information about historic techniques um, uh, and methodologies that um, have really um, brought a lot of information to the fore um, and who are just fascinated by trying to figure out how things work, you know, and how things were done. Um, and so, uh, I, you know, it's, it's never it's never black and white. You know, there's right. always lots of shades of gray in there. Right. Oh, and that's so true. And when when you talk about uh, you get you and, and your your colleagues getting paid to do this work where a hobbyist would do it out of fun. But there's also an interaction, I'm quite sure, uh, 
where you learn from each other, like with your conferences and the sharing of information. Oh, yes. I mean, the, the wonderful thing about the conferences is that we get people who have got, you know, academic historians. Um, we have stitchers. We have people who are, you know, interested in minute little details of, 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 of whatever they're interested in. And everybody comes together. And what's been particularly pleasing to me is when I've invited um, historians particularly to come who, you know, who are often not stitchers and not experienced at stitchers, what they discover that they can learn from people who are stitchers. And so, um, for example, Sally Tuckett, who's a, um, a textile scholar who teaches at the University of Glasgow, came and gave a lecture about Ayrshire work, which was the kind of professional embroidery that women in the southwest of Scotland and in Ireland could um, earn money um, doing. Well, she came and she sat, sat down um, at one of the panels of the Plymouth Tapestry, so, um, uh, which is a, a, a project being done to celebrate the 400th anniversary of the founding of the Plymouth Colony. And it's sort of a big project like the Bayou Tapestry. Anyway, Sally sat down. She's so proud. She stitched a line of stitching. And we all had to admire it. And, you know, she really kind of thought differently about that Ayrshire work afterwards. Uh, it was great. <laughs> uh-huh. Yep. Linda, once again, second time around, I learned so much. A real treat to talk with you. Thank you so much. Well, it's been an absolute pleasure to talk to you. Really enjoyed Thank you. it rant <laughs> yes yes get it get it off your chest yes blow off some steam that's right all right yeah. so uh thanks for that and and uh the insights and now so the next time we're going to make a date here the next time uh march 30 is the opening of costuming the crown right so uh somewhere in that neighborhood we're going to get you and laura and we're going to talk about this and um share some uh, behind the scenes things maybe that that would be great, yeah, because we're just about to start working on that. All right. Well, we'll look forward to that. Thank you, Linda, and uh, thanks to everyone for listening, and Christine and I will be back on Wednesday. <laughs>